I'm all digital these days with my notes, so I'll be zooming through my iPad. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here, and I just want to thank especially Munir Shaikh, uh, who put in so much work, and I'm sure had others helping him, but uh, he's really been just non-stopping in his care of us, and I, I thank you so much. Uh, so I represent the Christian tradition today, and I'm going to just jump right in. For Christians, uh, death exists as a paradox, as something at once lurking and vanquished. Death for Christians is that enemy at long, that at long last will be destroyed, and death has already been swallowed up in victory. This enigma might partially explain why many among the fervently religious are zealous users of life-extending technologies, while others are not. So in this talk, I aim to accomplish three goals. First, I'm going to present a big picture perspective on the Christian view of dying and death. And uh, as so often happens at these talks on medicine and religion, uh, usually people say, well, I can't really represent every Christian denomination. But what I'm going to tell you today, I think, is actually sort of shared general theology on death um, shared across the Christian denominations. At the very least, I hope you'll come away with an appreciation of the paradox that death represents in Christian teaching. Second, I will describe a body of literature known as the Ars Moriendi, Latin for art of dying, that was highly popular in the West for more than 500 years. The Ars Moriendi, I will argue, acknowledged this tension that exists when we say that death is defeated and remains to be conquered, the tension summarized by both death's impotence and death's sting. The Ars Moriendi helped communities anticipate and prepare for death, but it fell out of favor for a variety of reasons about 100 years ago. And so now finding themselves uncomfortable with death's paradox and having forgotten that death has already been defeated, many Christians turn to life-extending technologies to thwart death's sting. Finally, I will consider the implications of the reinvigoration of Inars Moriandi for uh, our era. Uh, I will consider the, the implications of that on an art of dying and specifically discuss some associated ethical tensions which uh, we've already alluded to a lot and as we were talking on the break, I think there will be a lot of thematic overview today, but that's probably good. So first, theology. Christian theology teaches that death is an enemy that has been destroyed and that death is an enemy that remains to be defeated. But if death has already been defeated, what remains to be destroyed, you might ask, and if death will be destroyed, how has it been defeated? So this, I would argue, is the paradox of Christian death. So let's kind of pick this apart. First, this idea of death as an enemy. Where does that come from? Uh, Christians believe that death is an enemy because it wasn't part of God's original design for creation. And this will sound familiar to many. Uh, Genesis 1 says that God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Note that the text does not say that creation was very good except for the part that was sick and dying. Right? Creation was very good and nothing less. One way to think about this is, is as an artist, right? No artist who aspires toward beauty or health or wholeness or love would design a masterpiece with serious flaws, right? God is that artist. A, a painter, for example, may well recognize that with the passing of time, her painting will show signs of wear and tear or even be destroyed. But she does not first design it that way. But creation, as the story tells us, wasn't to remain very good. From the beginning, God seemed to set up death as an enemy. In Genesis 2, so the very second book of, of the um, Hebrew scripture and Christian scripture, uh, God says to Adam, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. So from the beginning, Right? God equates the possibility of human disobedience with the actuality of death. Then when Adam and Eve eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they don't, they don't immediately die. 
but their world was no longer very good. Adam and Eve became filled with shame and fear, the text tells us. They, they hide themselves from God. They cast blame. Eve says it's, the, it's Adam. Adam says it's Eve. Eve says it's the snake. God tells them that their life would thenceforth be filled with great suffering. To Adam, God said, by the sweat of your face, ye shall eat uh, bread until you return to the ground, until you return from the, to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. This is Genesis 2. So this disobedience, what Christians have come to call sin, has brought death. So sin, disobedience, death, severed that once- perfect relationship between God and humans. And yet, Christians believe that one day this enemy death will be destroyed. So at the very end of the Bible, the book of Revelation records something of a vision that most scholars think uh, is a vision of what is to come, though there's some debate of this. And, and it's a vision of a new heaven and a new earth. And in this vision, John, who's rec recording the vision, recording the text, hears a loud voice from the throne saying, see the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. So note in this apocalyptic vision, humans are still mortal, but they won't die. Death will not have the ultimate word over creation or over human life, but not because of what medicine can do. So the paradox of Christian death is that it will be destroyed, but also that it has been defeated. And, and how is this? So this is a story that is undoubtedly familiar to everyone. Christians believe that death has been defeated because of the precedent set by Christ's resurrection from the dead. Because death or sin or disobedience had severed that once perfect communion humans shared with the divine, something had to be done to fix this, to restore this relationship. But of their own accord, humans lacked the power to make right this wrong. They could not possibly afford to pay the penalty incurred by their disobedience. So God therefore took on flesh, as the scriptures say, sort of common language for Christians, took on flesh, becoming fully human while retaining full divinity, and died on a cross, this ultimate sacrifice on behalf of humankind. But this God-man, fully God, fully human, did not stay dead, and after three days in the tomb, the story goes, this God-man whom Christians call Jesus Christ was resurrected on what came to be known as Easter Sunday. So the scripture says in, in 1 Corinthians, For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so will be made alive in Christ. So I hope you've gotten a sense of this paradox of death as defeated, waiting to be destroyed, and the sense that the resurrected Christ, who will ultimately defeat death for all time, has defeated death in time, resolving this paradox. So how have Christians, uh, in, a, in a traditional sense, inhabited this paradox? And one way, as I mentioned in my introduction, that, that they have is through something called the Ars Moriendi, or this art of dying, uh, a genre of literature and music, actually, that was popular, very popular in the West for more than 500 years. So I'm going to turn to that now. The human lifespan, as we know, significantly increased during the last century, um, pretty much doubling. But for most of human history, death and the preparation for death were a common part of everyday life. So this Ars Moriendi uh, developed during the aftermath of the bubonic plague that struck Europe in the mid-1300s. Uh, some historians estimate that the plague killed up to two-thirds of Europe's population, and uh, being a priest did not confer any special immunity to the plague, so everyone was dying. Uh, death really came to dominate the collective social consciousness in Europe. At the time, Western Europe's leading social authority was the Catholic Church, and there was a meeting of Catholic clergy 
over a schism in the Catholic Church in the early 1400s. And coming out of that meeting, there began to circulate these little booklets called the Ars Moriendi, or Art of Dying. Uh, they were akin to self-help manuals, and they walked both the clergy and the laity through the prayers and protocols for the preparation for death, sort of how to die for dummies. The central premise was that you die the way you, want, you live, and if you want to die well, you have to live well. The Ars Moriendi addressed roles for all members of the community, not just for the dying, also for the family, uh, even children. And these booklets became immensely popular. Uh, they were translated into many languages, spread all over Europe. They came to the United States. They were adopted by non-Catholics. Uh, Drew Faust, the president of Harvard University, in her historical work on the Civil War talks about Jews having adopted the tenets of the Ars Moriendi during the Civil War. Uh, and they really, they dominated the West for more than 500 years. So the Ars Moriendi spoke to this tension that exists when, when Christians say that death is both defeated and will be conquered. Um, the, the booklets initially existed in two forms. There was a text-based version and there was also a shorter illustrated version if you were illiterate. It still allowed you to anticipate and prepare for death by um, studying and meditating on the illustrations. Uh, the late theologian and ethicist Alan Verhey uh, of Duke University has a book called The Christian Art of Dying, and he describes the six components that characterize the Ars Moriendi really across all of its various permutations. Uh, and they are these, just to give you sort of a sense of what, what this work was all about. So first was a commendation of death. Second, a warning to the dying person of the temptations confronted by the dying and advice about how to resist them. So these temptations would be, you know, temptations to despair or to fear death, uh, sort of forgetting that death has already been defeated by Christ. Third was a short catechism including a Q&A on the subject of repentance and assurance of God's forgiveness. Fourth, instructions for the imitation of the dying Christ, so a reflection on the conquering of death, suggested prayers for use by the dying. Fifth was counsel to both the sick and those who care for the sick to attend to the preparation for death as a matter of first importance. So no matter what you do with your life, make sure you prepare for death. And six were prayers to be uttered by those who minister to the dying person. But as I mentioned at the outset, by the early 20th century, the Ars Moriendi began to fall out of favor. And this was for many complex factors, including social, religious, economic, and technological reasons. I make no claims of being a historian, and if there is a historian in the room, I'm sure you're going to groan by my next five sentences. But here goes. Um, the, I'm going to highlight several of the factors, and this is necessarily brief and simplistic. But these are some of the reasons. Just following World War I, which ended in 1918 in the US, there was a several year recession. And that was followed by a sustained period of economic growth, which some of you will remember has been called the Roaring Twenties. And part of the mission, if you will, of the Roaring Twenties was to break with tradition and to usher in a modern era. But with this came the secularization of American society. In part, it began to secularize. Church leaders and their congregants, tired of war and tired of death, uh, became less concerned with dying well and more interested in living well. So that what was taught in the pulpit and in the church changed. Manufacturing developed. More and more people moved to the cities to work, leaving their rural communities behind. Women joined men in the factories, uh, which meant that there were fewer people at home uh, to care for the sick or the dying. And as medical researchers developed antibiotics, new surgical procedures, mechanical life support over the course of the next 30, 40 years, the Ars Moriendi really became a literary genre of a bygone era. This constellation of changes triggered the loss of a framework for the preparation for death at the same time that technological de de advance was redefining illness and even death itself, and we've alluded to that already. Younger generations you know, of this modern era found themselves uncomfortable with death's paradox. Increasingly, life-extending technology provided comfort while thwarting death's sting. 
So it should be no surprise that our panel today is dedicated to the tensions created by medicalized care of the dying. Uh, as we all know, overuse of such technology, particularly as a patient is actively dying, is no secret. It's happening all the time. And disproportionate spending on health care in the last month of life is a frequently described economic problem. Now, while one might be tempted to think that it must be the least religious who cling desperately to technology for salvation, a study by Dr. Tracy Belboni and colleagues at Harvard found precisely the opposite. They found that patients receiving high levels of spiritual support from religious communities are less likely to receive hospice care and are more likely to receive aggressive medical interventions at the end of life and to die in an ICU. Now, I'm just going to make a brief aside, and that is that when you look at the uh, religious breakdown of the people who describe themselves as highly religious in this study, they're almost all uh, various Christian denominations, and there are no uh, Jews or Muslims who describe themselves as being from highly religious communities, just to put that out there. So they, they found this to be true even after controlling for confounding variables. But they also found that patients receiving high levels of spiritual support from religious communities tended toward less aggressive end-of-life care when the medical team, interestingly, provided spiritual support, including end-of-life discussions. So they conclude that this underscores the need for further research. I think every study ends that way. Um, <laughs> And also, greater clinician spiritual care training, which I think we all agree on, and faith-based initiatives engaging religious communities regarding end-of-life issues. So in short, I think what they're saying is that medical professionals need to work together with religious communities to have frank and serious conversations about medical and spiritual care of the aging and the dying. So Balboni's suggestions dove dovetail nicely with the project to which I've dedicated my attention in recent years, and that is what might a revived Ars Moriendi look like today? I mean, could we, could we write one of these self-help booklets? If we could revive the Ars Moriendi, what effect would it have on medicalized dying? Would, for example, fewer people be surprised by death's imminence when the doctor declares that medicine has nothing left to offer? Would fewer patients elect to die in the ICU connected to various forms of life-sustaining treatment? So in 2010, I, I wrote about this and was subsequently asked to edit a book on the subject. And that's the book that uh, Munir graciously gave a shout out about before. Uh, so I, I um, was asked to articulate a fra framework for a modern art of dying but not with reference to religion, as was the original Ars Moriendi, but with reference to bioethics, to use bioethics as the tool to frame the question of whether we could have a, a contemporary art of dying. Uh, the great thing about bioethics is that it's a field that has traditionally allowed for dialogue among medical people, religious scholars, philosophers, and legal scholars. And it also is not exclusively Christian. And this is exactly what my book brings together. Um, scholars from these various disciplines got together in an attempt to articulate this. So in the book's concluding chapter, I argue that if bioethics itself, and I'm a little unsure that bioethics actually could do it, but if bioethics itself could do anything to solve the problem of medicalized dying, it would have to be a very robust bioethics, a bioethics that allows for theology and theology of its various um, uh, representing various faiths. Only this sort of bioethics could foster both the contemplation of finitude and the cultivation of community that would be necessary for the creation of an art of dying well. Only a very robust sense of bioethics could tackle the dilemmas created by modern medicalized dying while entertaining the existential questions uh, addressed by religion. Balboni's study suggests that religious people today, particularly Christians, are more likely to die medicalized deaths. One moral dilemma that a modern art of dying would have to clear up then, specifically, and specifically for religious patients, is whether the withdrawal of life support is equivalent to killing. 
a distinction that bioethicists typically describe as killing versus allowing to die. And we have um, alluded to this, and I'm just gonna spend a few minutes for the rest of my talk on this subject, uh, picking it apart a little bit uh, theoretically using some of Dr. Salmezi's work, and then I will end, okay? So consider the following scenario. Mrs. P is a 60-year-old woman who has battled cancer for the past eight years. It has returned twice. Both times her doctors used chemo and radiation to keep it at bay. The third time it recurred, it was widely metastatic. She had it in her bones, her lungs, her liver. It was so bad in her lungs, she got a superimposed pneumonia, required mechanical ventilation to support her breathing. Intubated, she was still able to communicate, and at some point she and her husband decide, together with the physician, that uh, she had had enough. And they asked for the life support to be stopped. Uh, they all knew that she would probably die within minutes to hours, if not days, were they killing her. And if we think about this from the perspective of our patients, this is, is the common scenario. So in order to answer this question, we must define the terms, what is killing, what is allowing to die. And here I will refer to uh, Dr. Solmezi's very careful treatment of the subject. Um, Dr. Solmezi defines killing as the class of acts in which an agent creates a new lethal pathophysiological state with the specific intention and in acting of thereby causing a patient's death. So a new lethal pathophysiological state intending to kill the patient. And he distinguishes this from allowing to die, which he defines as an act in which an agent either performs an action to remove an intervention that forestalls or ameliorates a pre-existing fatal condition or refrains from action that would forestall or ameliorate a pre-existing fetal condition, either with the specific intention of acting that this person should die by way of that act or not so intending. So if I were to make any slide, it would have had this on it, and it's kind of a lot, but um, it, it's sort of intuitively what you think. I'm gonna just pick it apart a little bit more. So if we were to apply these definitions back to Mrs. P's case, the doctor, by removing the mechanical ventilator, would not be creating a new lethal pathophysiological state in Mrs. P. But he would be removing an intervention that has been forestalling a pre-existing fatal condition. The doctor understands very well that Mrs. P will likely die by way of this act, but his intention is not to kill her. Now many religious people undoubtedly find this thought discomforting. If a doctor really knows that a patient will die when life support is removed, how is this not in effect killing? And here Solmezi draws a finer distinction. He states that based on the definitions he provides, all killing is morally wrong, while some allowing to die is morally wrong and some isn't. Stick with me. So let's assume that same Mrs. P, twice cured of cancer, comes into the hospital with a severe life-threatening pneumonia, but she doesn't have a third recurrence of her cancer. She's an otherwise healthy 60-year-old woman with a really bad pneumonia. She goes to the hospital because she wants to receive treatment. So what if in this scenario, her physician refused to honor her wishes and declined to provide antibiotics or mechanical ventilation? He would, he reasons, allow her to die of her underlying disease. Now surely this sort of allowing to die is morally wrong, right? And tantamount to killing. And so I think we can clarify that there is a distinction in allowing to die that is morally acceptable and one that is not morally acceptable when comparing those two scenarios of Mrs. P. In distinguishing between killing and allowing to die, the intention of the actor always matters. Solmezi notes that intention is difficult ultimately to know, and it is not the same as belief or desire. Despite its opaque nature, intention can be elucidated by asking what Mrs. P's doctor might do if he withdraws life support and she does not die. Does he then inject potassium chloride to finish her off? If he does, this would suggest that his intention then, all along, was to bring about her death and not simply to remove the technology that was delaying an inevitable death or allowing her to die. So I'm gonna jump to the conclusion. Um, 
I think, I hope I've explained the paradox of Christian death and described one way through the Ars Moriendi that Christians have inhabited this paradox. Uh, I gave you a very rough uh, overview of why uh, the Ars Moriendi died out, as it were, um, and have suggested that a secularizing America lost the sense of the paradox of Christian death. And then I showed that it is those Christian patients well supported by religious communities that are most likely to experience medicalized deaths. In seeking to establish an art of dying for the 21st century, I have suggested that one way clinicians must work together with religious communities is to clarify for them this distinction between killing and allowing to die, something that came up so nicely in the Q&A for our first panel. So Maisie said this, and I think this is a nice way to end. Although medicine has traditionally prohibited intending the death of patients, this by no means um, should be taken as indicating that patients are prisoners of technology. A revived Ars Morandi might help in part to demedicalize dying and to liberate imprisoned patients who do not stand to benefit from the technology that shackles them. A revived Ars Morandi might also remind Christian patients at least of death's paradox and of the God who is the ultimate sustainer of life. Thank you. <laughs>